Mm -hmm. my, my lord my, my own co-host so i'm not bringing the students in so that that mm. My Lord, uh, okay. Now, so student, a uh, very good afternoon to you. I have to repeat myself because there's a problem with the uh, the, the the initial. <laughs> uh commencement so as i told you this afternoon we are very privileged to have very seasoned well respected jurists and prolific uh, writer on pertinent topics of Ghanaian law uh, whose works have been cited by supreme court and by other uh, superior course of education in some other teaching and various uh, academics, researchers, and students. Now, he is a fellow of Ghana Academy of Arts and Sciences, the very uh, respected intellectual uh, in Swishin. And recently he gave his, recently he gave his inaugural uh, uh, no lecture. A two. Uh, six nine. Praise the. He gave uh, his uh, inaugural uh, lecture as far as uh, uh, trends in Ghana are concerned. He recently, until recently, he was a professor at the Ghana uh, Gimpa School of Law and a dean of Ghana. Empire School of Law. He's a, prof a visiting professor to so many universities, including Kwame Nkrumah University of Science and Technology. Now he is the director of the Judicial Training Institute, and he is also served as a facilitator of bureau's uh, training session for judges, academics, and practitioners. He has been knighted the highest honor which can be given to uh, a lay person within the Catholic Church by uh, His Holiness, uh, the Pope, the Vicar of Christ, or the Roman Pontiff. So that is why he has say attached to his name. And for that matter, I am very privileged to have had His Lordship, Justice Sir Denis Dominic Ajay, to have accepted the have accepted the invitation to come and speak to us uh, at this moment when you are preparing to write an examination. So I'm very happy to welcome Worship Sir Professor Dennis Dominic Ajay to our virtual class. My Lord, you're very much welcome. My Lord, you're very much welcome. My Lord, uh, please, my Lord, if you'll mute yourself. Uh, good. Thank you, Dr. Enes Osudapa. Dr. Enes Osudapa invited me to come and assist in the tutorials, and I couldn't say no. So the only answer was yes. 
that is why I'm with you this evening. I'm so most you are welcome. Most grateful, my Lord. And my Lord, uh, before you came, you've actually been uh, using your material. Uh, oh, that's good. Yes, for the revision. So I'm happy that uh, you are here yourself. So once my Lord is here, uh, my Lord, I will hand over to you and then uh, you take over and tell us all that you want us to hear, especially as we go and write the exams on Tuesday. Thank you very much. Thank you, my brother, Dr. Andes Usudapa. My, my respected brother said that I'll continue to be the, the director for the Judicial Training Institute. I, I hand it over to my brother, Justice Mafasan, who unfortunately passed on last week. Oh, oh, oh may so rest in peace. Sorry, my Lord. Sorry, 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 sorry. He was a brother and friend. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes, yes, yes. Very sorry. <laughs> yes. So we are discussing land law in Ghana. When we talk about land, the definition of land is notoriously known. We are talking about the earth things on it, including rivers, river bodies, and waters. And when we talk about land in Ghana, we are talking about several laws that regret land in Ghana. When we talk about um, the status of general application, common law, and common law, which is made up of for the purposes of land law, when I talk about customary land law, I'm talking about principles of um, common law, customary law, and our traditional um, customary law. So when we talk about laws on uh, land, it is important that we go back to the Supreme Court Ordinance of 1876. When the Supreme Court Ordinance of 1876 was passed in Ghana for the British to take care of her colony, the condition was that all the English statutes, including common law and equity, which were enforced in Britain as far back as 1874, were to become part of our laws. So as at now, we continue to have principles of equity, common law, as part of our law. Quite often people ask, why do you continue to talk about some laws which were made in 1539, such as the, such as the, the Trustees Act, the, the English Trustees Act of 1859, 1840? Why do you continue to use them? We continue to use them because they are part of English status of general application. And if you read section 117119 of the Course Act, it tells you that 10 of the English statutes on land continue to form part of our laws, including the, the English Property Act of 1925. There are some provisions, not all of them. So if you pick the, the course act, go to sections 117, 119, you will find the laws which are enforced. They are English statutes, but they continue to form part of our law. And they are only 10. The Sestikivik Act, the Trustees Act of, of of 1539, Trustees Act of 1540. Please, we are not talking about the whole sections. For example, if you talk about the, the Trustees Act of 1539, it was one, sections one to 120. But now we are left with only sections one and two. I just want you to understand the background. Why in land matters we refer to cases um, um, which are English laws because we continue to have some of them as part of statutes of general application. Then, apart from that one, we all know that the constitution is the supreme law on the land. It outlines, Article 18 will tell you that you have a right to acquire property. You have a right to acquire property. Then Article 20 will tell you that government can acquire property. If government is acquiring property, government may buy a land government may receive land as a gift. But if government requires land in a prime area for certain up industries, buildings for public use, nobody will be ready to, to relinquish his or her interest in that land to the state. That is why if you look at Article 20, it talks about compulsory acquisition. When we talk about compulsory acquisition, we are talking about the 
eminent domain, the eminent domain of the state to acquire any land that the state requires in the public interest for public use or for morality, for time and country planning. Once it is within Article 20, then the state can acquire it by paying reasonable, fair, and prompt compensation. So, and if you move on to Article 266, 267 of the Constitution, Article 266 of the Constitution talks about non citizens of Ghana. So, what I want you to understand is that whenever we talk about land law in Ghana, the Constitution draws a distinction between a citizen of Ghana and non citizen of Ghana. And when we talk about citizen of Ghana, you all know by virtue of the Constitution as well as the Citizenship Act, you know, a citizen of Ghana. And the law is that. If you are not a citizen of Ghana, you cannot acquire interest in land exceeding 50 years at any one time. And Article 266, cross one, specifically states that where a non citizen of Ghana acquires an interest in, in, in land, which is freehold, which is freehold, it is void ab initio. Which is freehold, it is void ab initio. So having mentioned this freehold, let me now start and introduce you to what we mean by interest in land. Interest in land. When we talk about land, we have two things in land. You may have an interest in, in land or right in or right over land. So it is interest against rights. You may have a right in or right over a land, or you may have an interest in land. When we talk about an interest in land, we are talking about we are talking about an interest interest which is capable of being owned. That is, it can be described as ownership that you own that land, that you own that land. If it is not capable of being owned, it will not come under under the definition of interest. It may come under the definition of a right. So let's look at the interest that we have in Ghana. The interest that we have in Ghana, there are only um, there are only six. The first one is Alodia title, and the person who holds is the Alodia owner. Alodia title is held by an Alodia owner. Then we have number two, a customary law freehold. Customary law freehold. I will explain them. Then we have number three, a common law freehold. A common law freehold. Then we have number four, you suffractuary interest. You suffractuary interest. Then we have a leasehold interest. A leasehold interest. Then the sixth one, customary tenancy. Customary tenancy. Let's look at the first one, Alodia interest. It is the highest or ultimate interest in land that a person may acquire. It is the highest or the ultimate interest in land that a person may acquire. And if you read Ohimin versus AJ and the ancient cases, we were told that a Lodia interest could be acquired by a stool or skin, a stool or skin, crown or family or an individual. You have to understand what we mean by a stool or a skin, a stool or skin, and its legal effect. When we talk about a, we talk about a stool or a skin. Our brothers and sisters in the northern sector they use skin. And those from Bruno up to the coast, they use stool. And we say that when we talk about a stool, a stool is a corporate, is a corporate soul. A stool is a corporate soul with capacity to seal and be sealed, and capacity to own and acquire interest in land and divest its interest in land. If you read Amankwa versus Chere, it Amankwa versus Chere, it defines what a stool means and the capacity of a stool. So a stool is a corporate soul 
with capacity to seal and be sealed and capacity to acquire land and alienate land. And as we all know, when we talk about a stool, a stool must be occupied by somebody. Always we need a chief to occupy a stool. And the definition of, uh, definition of a chief, if you read Article 277 of the Constitution, a chief includes a queen mother. A chief includes a queen mother. So when we talk about a stool, we talk about both male and female stools, both males and female stools, and they can own interest in land. And traditionally, when we talk about the stools, we talk about the skins, how did they acquire land? They acquired land, number one, through conquest and settlement. Conquest and settlement. They will conquer you, then they settle. They conquer you, then they settle. Number two, they acquired through pioneer discovery and settlements. Pioneer discovery. Pioneer discovery. Some test writers will mention hunters. Hunters are part of pioneer, are, are part of pioneers. So pioneer discovery includes hunters. They will go and discover, they will come and inform their stool. We found a virgin land, it is uncultivated. Then the stool may go and settle its people on that land. So when you settle somebody in a virgin land and the land had not been acquired, that means you will acquire the highest interest, the ultimate interest in that land. And that is what we call the Alodia interest. Then the students may also acquire through gifts, gifts or purchase or agreements. So traditionally, traditionally, Alodia interests were acquired by the states through conquest, pioneer discovery and settlement, gift, purchase, or agreements. Then, stools and crowns also acquired land. When you talk about families, we know families. It is then um, the, the nuclear state of people. So you may have paterna or materna, patrilineal or matrilineal system. But if you have three or more, two or more families coming together, that's where we have something we call a crown. So it is aggregation of two or more families, then we call it a crown. So a crown may acquire a land, um, a family may acquire a land, or even individuals also acquired land. But the individuals, there wasn't any conquest, they did not fight. So they will go and discover and they settle. Or some of them acquired through gifts and some of them through purchase or agreements. So traditionally, when we talk about bodies capable of acquiring a lodia interest. We refer to the stool or skin, crown, family, or an individual. But now, because of compulsory acquisition, the Land Act says that when we talk about a lodia interest, the state also has a lodia interest. And the state acquires its a lodia interest through compulsory acquisition, gifts, and purchase. But how many stools? would agree to, to sell their highest interest in the land to the state. They will not. That is why the state has the power to compulsorily acquire land. That is what we call the eminent domain of the state. So compulsory acquisition. Once a land is compulsorily acquired, then the state has the highest interest in land. So if you have a land, let me use a juice a juice stool. Then the government requires part of a business tool for either railways, tramway, or any other thing that will benefit the whole country. The government is required to comply with Article 20 of the Constitution and compulsory acquire the land. Please, there is a distinction between expropriation and compulsory acquisition. Expropriation means the government has used it is eminent domain to acquire your land without paying compensation. But in Ghana, the constitution requires that expropriation should not be used, but rather compulsory acquisition, that fair and prompt payment shall be paid. And if it is not paid, any person who, who is dissatisfied may seek redress in the high court. Please, in terms of compulsory acquisition, if, com if compensation is not paid or the adequate compensation is not paid, or a reasonable amount is not paid as compensation. A person whose land has been acquired 
may seek redress in the high court. It is the high court which has exclusive original jurisdiction. So that is the compulsory acquisition. So now, when we talk about Alodia interest in Ghana, the state owns about 20% of the lands in Ghana through compulsory acquisition. So whenever government acquires land now, you lose any interest that you have. So assuming I use Ebiso, so, so if government acquires a parcel of land at Ebiso, government will pay for the Alodia, Alodia interest, you pay for all those with lesser interest, and at the end of the day, government holds the highest interest in the land, which is the Alodia. So now, if you look at the, the Land Act, Section 2, and we are talking about Alodia interest, compulsory acquisition has become one, one of the moves by which the state can use to acquire Alodia interest. Now, I mentioned expropriation. At times, there is this question which people find it difficult to appreciate. Why is it that the 1992 Constitution, Article 266, refers to 1969, 22nd of August, 1969, and says that all those non-citizens of Ghana who acquired land, who, who acquired land in Ghana in excess of 50 years had their interest converted from whatever interest to a term of 50 years at any one time. And you continue to even pay a rent, but that rent is pepper corn. Pepper corn means pepper plus corn. How much? How much does it cost? Useless. You just pay just, um, just the smallest coin, as may be quoted by the state for you to pay, just to, 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 to recognize that the state has become your, your lesser. What I'm saying here is that the 1969 Constitution came into force on 22nd of August, 1969. And when the law came into force, what the law did was that all non-citizens of Ghana who had freehold interest, their interests were converted by law from freehold to leases of maximum of 50 years. So assuming somebody had a low dear interest and the person was not a citizen of Ghana, on the coming into force of the 1969 constitution, that interest converted to a lease of 69, at least of 50 years. And the government of Ghana will become your lessor. And you will be the lessee. Lessor and lessee. The person who, who is creating a lesser interest in his freehold to a person is known as lessor. And the person who is benefiting from the interest with limited interest is known as the lessee. So here I'm talking about lessor and lessee. So the, the 19... 92 constitution only re-emphasized, re-emphasized the position outlined in the 1969 constitution that all non-citizens of Ghana could not acquire any interest exceeding 50 years at any one time. And all those who had automatically conversion from the freehold to 50 years. If it were a lease, it converted from, if it were 80 years, 70 years on expired interest, automatically, it, it became 50 years interest. So Article 266 of the Constitution only re, reaffirmed the position outlined in the 1969 Constitution. And the date, people normally ask, why 22nd of August? Because the 1969 Constitution came into force on 22nd of August, 1969. And all those who, the non-citizens of Ghana who had interest in land at that time, their 50 year lease, which was, it, it was expropriation because they were not, they were not given any, any, any compensation. If I have a land, a freehold, then you pass a law to change it to 50 years and, and I become a lessee and you become my, my lessor. You have taken advantage of me. It, it was an expropriation. And the 1992 constitution, only, it, it just restates what was in the 1969 constitution. So that is for the Alodia title. Let's move on to the second interest, second interest in land. Please, the second and the third, you can use any, they can be used interchangeably, depending on how you may present your case. So in, in some textbooks, they will talk about customary law freehold, 
cast too many law freehold. And others may, may use their tool as common law freehold. Any of the two, it doesn't take away anything because all of them, we, we call them derivative interest. Why do we call them derivative interest? They are derivative interest because they derive their source from a Lodia title. They derive their source from a Lodia title. And it is therefore a derivative interest. It is a derivative interest. Now, let's look at Cashman Law Freehold. My, my dear students, please, there, there was a confusion between Cashman Law Freehold and usufructuary interest. They were used interchangeably by some test writers, but some, some test writers also insisted that there was a distinction. So the Land Act, Act 1036, has drawn a distinction between customer law freehold and usufructuary interest. So assuming you are asked, they are two different things now. They are not the same. So disregard any textbook that said that the two, the two were one and the same. They are no more one and the same. Section three of the Land Act talks about customer law freehold, while section four, sorry, section five talks about usufructuary interest. So let's look at the second one, or the third, as the case may be, customary law freehold. Customary law freehold. It is derived from Alodia interest, and it must be acquired in accordance with customary law. It must be acquired in accordance with customary law. Please, land law, you must understand your constitutional law very well. When we talk about when we talk about customary law. Customary law is not the same as custom. There is a difference between a custom and a customary law. When we say a custom, a custom is the practice or practices of a particular community. But when we say it is a customary law, we are saying that it is a custom of a particular, particular community, which has become law. That means it has been enacted into law. That is one mode one method where there is a custom and the custom is enacted into law, it becomes a custom and law and no more a custom. Or the second one, where there is a custom and there is a judicial pronouncement on that custom, a judicial pronouncement on that custom by a superior court, such as the regional tribunal, the high court, the Court of Appeal and the Supreme Court, whenever one of them pronounces upon a custom, it ceases to be a custom and becomes a customary law. That is why we say that a customary law is a question of law and not a question of fact. Why do we say that it is a question of law? If it's a custom and it is enacted into law and there's a law, it is a question of law. Or where it is pronounced upon by a superior court, you, you, it is a court of record. You can just refer to it. That is why in 1960, in, in 1960, the before 1960, the position was that Cashman law um, was, was a question of fact, but now a Cashman law is a question of law because you will find it in a decision rendered by a superior court. Please, a decision rendered by a lower court remains, remains the question a custom and not a Cashman law because they are not cause of record. So if you read Article, Article 11, Sources of Law, you will find it when it mentions the common law of Ghana. And it says the common law of Ghana includes the rules generally known as common law, rules generally known as equity, and customary law, including those determined by the superior court. That is the rationale. So if you are talking about a customary law, then we are talking about a question of law. You may find it in the decision or an enactment, a decision rendered by a superior court or an enactment. So here, we talk about customer law freehold. What we are saying now is that a person who is not a subject, who, is, who may not be a subject, may acquire a land outright from the stool or skin or a clan or family who chose the Alodia title. You go, you negotiate, you acquire, and you take it. That was the position. And the, and the transaction was made in accordance with custom. 
once the transaction was made in accordance with custom and you acquired absolute interest in the land, then the position was that you have acquired customary law freehold. And one thing we must know is that customary law freehold is perpetual, is perpetual, and it is inheritable. The features, it is perpetual, it is alienable, it is inheritable. You can give it out without informing the Alodia owner, but it is your interest which is being given out, but you cannot alienate that of the Alodia owner. You alienate your interest in the land. They coexist. And as, as I said before, the constitution which came into force on 22nd day of August, 1969, I'm talking about the 1969 constitution, proscribed, I'm saying proscribed, P-R-O-S-C-R-I-B-E-D, abolish it, proscribed. Freehold interest, that is customer law freehold interest by a non-citizen of Ghana. The 1969 constitution proscribed it and converted it to a lease of 50 years. Let's look at the third interest, which we call common law freehold. You may call it second or third, because the two of them, they derive their root from the Alodia title. When we talk about common law freehold, what we are saying is that a person acquires an interest in land, which is perpetual, free from every obligation, and it is acquired in accordance with common law. The, the acquisition was made in accordance with common law and you acquired it absolutely. That is why the name common law freehold. When it was customer law and it was absolute, it was customer law freehold. So when we talk about where people acquired land absolutely and the alienation was made in accordance with common law, it became known as common law freehold. And it is of perpetual duration. It is uncertain. But because it is common law freehold, we must know that when we talk about common law freehold, it exists in three forms. Common law freehold exists in three forms. The first one is what we call fee simple. Fee simple, meaning you have acquired it, there is no limitation. There is no restriction. You, you acquire it absolutely. Then there's a second one, which we call fee tail. Fee tail. Fee tail means it is absolute, but subject to a condition. So where a land is given to somebody and his nephews, and that person dies, and the person did not leave behind a nephew, that means it will go back to the Alodia owner. So here, here, that interest is subject to having nephews surviving you. So it becomes a fee tail. Then the third one is what we call life interest. Somebody may alienate a land to you that take it so far as you live. So if you live up to 170 years, you take it, but immediately you, you die, your interest becomes extinct. So when we talk about we talk about common law freehold, it exists in three form. Fee simple, absolute, fee tail, subject to other conditions. Then life interest, it is up to you. If you die, it ends there. So even if you sell, somebody may buy, but immediately you die, it will go back to the Alodia owner. Then the acquisition of common law freehold interest in respect of stool and scan lands were also proscribed by the 1969 constitution. They were proscribed. So all non-citizens of Ghana who held common law freehold lost them to a lease of 50 years at any one time, subject to payment of peppercorn rent to the president of the Republic of Ghana acting for and on behalf of the Republic of Ghana. We, we've been talking about a citizen of Ghana, a citizen of Ghana. But if you read the constitution, you read the Citizenship Act, it talks about human beings, human beings. But if you are talking about aeroplanes and those things, we know that they are regulated by, by international law. What about companies in Ghana? They were not provided for. They were, they were not provided for. So the position was that before the coming to force of the Land Act, 
on 23rd of December, 2020, the position was that companies which had foreign interests could not acquire any interest exceeding 50 years. But this position has changed. Section 10, section 10, subsection 10, section 10, 10, section 10, 10 of the Land Act, Act 1036, has now defined a company or corporate body who is not a citizen of Ghana. So if a company or corporate body in Ghana has less than 40% 40 per, 40 of equity shareholding, 40% of equity shareholding or ownership is held by non-citizens. So where non-citizens hold 40%, it is permissible, but but when non-citizens hold less than forty percent, then it is uh, it is it is not it is a Ghanaian company. So the test is when we are talking about a company or a corporate for the purposes of land acquisition that it is a Ghanaian, that it is a Ghanaian. Then we are talking about where the where the company or the body corporate. It's not a citizen if more than 40% of the equity shares or ownership is held by non citizens. The 40%. So, any company with foreign interest of 40% or more is not a Ghanaian company and cannot acquire interest exceeding 50 years at any one time. And cannot acquire interest exceeding that one at any one time. Now, let's move on to the, the other interest, usufractuary interest. Usufractuary interest. Usufractuary interest, under the old law, under our old law, usufractuary interest was acquired by a citizen, a, a, a subject of a stool, a subject of a skin, a member of a clan, a member of a stool, which, sorry, a member of a family which owes allow their interest in that land. Then by virtue of being a subject of the stool, you cultivate, that is uh, um, Kwame and Kufo, then carry a case. That was where it, where it was said that, where your cutlass will take you. So the lazy persons, they acquired only a small portion. But if you acquire a larger course, they were industrious, they could cultivate. Any portion that they cultivated became their, their land. And the recent case of Atib, Opon versus Atiburukusu, Upon, upon versus Atiburukusu. It was a virgin land. Then uh, a subject of the stew said that, yes, it is a virgin land, but it is for us. We are subject of the stew, and it is for us. And when it traveled to the Supreme Court, the Supreme Court held that, yes, if you are, if you are a subject of a stew, you are a member of a family, and that family or the stew holds a low their interest. You cannot hold interest in the land until until you until you cultivate. So if you do not cultivate, it will still remain the property of the alodia holder. So if you, if you were a subject of that stool, it will be owned by the stool. If it were acquired by the family, it will be owned by that family. So it is very very important. So when we talk about now under the Land Act, when we talk about Section Five there are two modes by which a supernatural interest may be acquired. The first one is what we knew, that it, you, you exercise your inherent rights as a subject of a stool or skin, or a member of a family or clan, who chose the Alodia title, and you cultivate. If you cultivate, you acquire that, that land. And under the old regime, the law was that you could go and cultivate without express grant, but on the coming into force of this land act, you need express permission. The old law was that you did not require permission, but the act is that now, if you are going to acquire it now, you need permission of the family or whoever or whoever. Now, the second mode of acquiring, the second mode of acquiring usufractuary interest is where A person acquired land through settlement, the person 
who goes and apply land through settlement for a period of not less than 50 years. For a period of not less than 50 years. With the permission of the holder of an Aludia title, when they are non indigent, when they are not, when they are non indigent, where they are non indigent or group of not indigent, they come onto your land, they ask your permission, you permit them, they cultivate the land for 50 years, they settle on the land. In that sense, they also acquire usufractuary interest in the land. So now there are two modes by which usufractuary interest may be acquired. The first one is where a subject of a school or skin or a member of a family or, or clan exercise its inherent right to cultivate part of the land. Then you acquire an interest in land. And that interest that you acquire is what is known as the usufractuary interest. Then usufractuary interest is inheritable and alienable. It is inheritable and, and alienable. The only exception that has been introduced by the Land Act is that if non-indigent acquire usufractuary interest and that person is alienating the land, then he requires the written consent of the stew or the skin or the clan or family, which give him or her the land. If non-indigents or group of non-indigents acquire land, they acquire usufractuary interest by virtue of the of settlement for a period of not less than 50 years. If they want to alienate the land, they require the written consent of the stew or the skin or the clan or family or group which own the alodia interest in the land. Then the next one is what we call the leasehold. So please, before I talk about leasehold, in Ghana, when we talk about freehold interest, freehold interest means interest which are not constrained by time, interest not constrained by time. And the interest not constrained by time, they are alodia title, customer law freehold, common law freehold, and usufractuary interest. These four are the freehold interest that we have in Ghana. Apart from this one, then we move on to an interest in land, an interest in land, which is limited or constrained by time, an interest in land, which is constrained by time. And that is what we call a leasehold, a leasehold. Please, whenever we talk about a leasehold, we are saying that somebody has an interest in land and that interest is one of the freeholds interest. It could be a lodia, it could be customer law, it could be common law freehold, it could be supernatural interest. And that person is going to create a lesser interest. For example, 60 years, 70 years, 40 years, 50 years. It is constrained by time to another person. So if I have a land, if I have a supernatural interest, it, it, it is indeterminate. So I can create a lesser interest constrained by time. In that sense, if I am a supernatural interest holder or common law freeholder or customer law freeholder, and I want to give somebody 50 year interest in my land, the new agreement, because I am a freeholder, I will be the lessor. And I'm going to create a number of interests in your favor and you become the lessee. So that is why we have a leasehold. That is why we create a lessor and lessee. So whenever we have the lessor and the lessee, the lessor has one of the freehold's interest and he's creating an interest in land which is limited by time in favor of somebody who is referred to as the, the lessee. And if you read, uh, we have implied covenant between the lessor and the lessee that, you know, implied covenants, they are very, very important. But for the purposes of your examination, I will talk about a few of the implied covenants between lessor and lessees. Then the implied covenants between the lessor and the lessees, we'll find them in section 51, section 51 of the Land Act. Section 51 of the Land Act. 50 and 51, 50 and 51. Section 50 is the implied covenants by transfer of. Implied covenant by transfer of. And 51 is implied covenants by a person to whom transfer is made.
what we what we, we knew was that when a person acquired land at common law or the previous under our previous laws, when a person acquired land, we had implied covenant and express covenant. Implied covenants were the covenants introduced into into the into the transaction by law, whether you like it or not, it has been introduced by law. Then express covenants are those which are not part of the implied covenants, but you want to take advantage of them. Then you bring them as express covenants. Under the old regime, the position was that if a, not, if a person held a supernatural interest in land and the land fell into outskirts, the land fell into outskirts, the Alodia owner could not alienate without your consent. But that position has been changed as a result of the implied covenant. Section 50, subsections 20 and 21, and even 22. Section 50, subsections 20, 21, and 22 of the Land Act 1036. The post, you know, uh, the case of Boatin versus Menu, it is in 19, um, it is in 2007, 2008. Supreme Court Ghana Law Report, where the judicial unit decided to alienate a land occupied by an usurpatory interest holder because the land had fallen into outskirts. The Supreme Court held that no, it is the usufract owner who must alienate, but the position has been changed by section 50, subsection 20, 21, and 22. The position of the law now is that where the Alodia title holder requires the law requires a land occupied by an usufra for expansion for expansion of a town or settlement for expansion of a town or settlement or for the purpose of serving the community interest then the alodia owner may acquire the land and when that alodia owner acquires the land the condition is that he must give the person 40 percent of the props or 40% of the market value of the land. So now it is a modification to the old law. It has modified the old law. Now the Alodia owner will sell when the land falls into outskirts and the land is required for expansion of a town or for settlement. That is one of them. Now let me talk about customary tenancy. Customary tenancy. As I said, Customary law is part of our law. So when we talk about customary tenancy, what we are saying is that we are talking about tenancy regulated by custom and has been accepted as the true position of the law and has been accepted as the true position of the law. At, at custom, at custom, the position was that the, the position was that any person, any person who had a land, particularly a Lodia interest, may enter into an agreement with a tenant for the tenant to cultivate the land, for the tenant to cultivate the land. And if the land is cultivated, at the end of the day, they must share the produce, they must share it is the sharing of the produce of, of the farm, the sharing of the produce of the farm or proceeds from the farm. Please, it was a custom and it, it, it attained judicial pronouncement. So it became a customary law. So in most cases where the parties agree that after maturity, they will partition the land, the court held it was offensive to customary law because customary law knew of sharing of produce of a farm and not physical partition of the farm. Please, this one has been changed. The customary, uh, the customary tenancy, who says that Abunu and Abusa is limited to only the sharing of the produce of a farm has been changed. So the law now is that by section seven, section seven of the Land Act, the law now is that they can agree on rent. The law now is that it is a contract. It has become a contract. And if it is a contract, then they may agree. They may agree on payment of rents or the sharing of the produce of a farm, the, the old one. It is a contract, so now they can still talk about it. Or they can physically partition or 
severance of the farmland, they can partition or severe the farmland. So it is no more the sharing of the produce of a farm, but now it is physical. It, but, but they may agree on that one, or they may agree on rent, or they may also agree on physical partition or severance of the farm. This is section seven, Se section seven. Before I talk about people with capacity to alienate, let me draw your attention to this part. It is very, very important. In Ghana, as I, as I said earlier, in 1876, when the Supreme Court ordinance came into force, part of the laws that we, inher we, we inherited included common law. And common law at that time said that a person, or a person under 21 years was an infant. A person under 21 years was an infant. A person under 21 years was an infant. And the English people changed the years in 1956 through the Family Law Act. But we haven't changed ours. So in Ghana, when we talk about infants, we continue to have infant as a person under 21. Please, there is a clear distinction between a child and infant. A child is a person under 18, if you read the Constitution or the Children's Act. But an infant has, has not been defined because it was a common law, which we, which we inherited. But now, some laws are changing theirs. Some laws in Ghana, for example, under the Companies Act now, when you say an infant, an infant is a person under 18 years, it is no more under 21. Then the Land Act has also changed who is an infant in land law. So, so now in Ghana, infants in land law, infants in company law, we are talking about persons under 18 years and no more 21. But apart from company law, apart from land law, and apart from section 18 of the course act, when, when we are appointing a guardian to maintain the affairs of, uh, of, of a person under 18, when we talk about infant, we are referring to 21. But when it is land law, when it is company law, when it is an appointment to maintain a child, then for the purpose of, of these three laws, when we talk about infant, we are talking about person under 18 years. So always understand and draw that distinction. So now, if you are not of 18, you cannot acquire land in your name. If you are not of 18, you cannot acquire land in your name. If you are not of 18 and you want to acquire land, you acquire land in the name of a proprietor and the proprietor will hold it in trust for you. The proprietor will hold it in trust for you. Now, we have talked about the various interests in land. Let's look at who can alienate and those who cannot alienate. These are the, 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 the important aspect of law. Whether it's through land, it could be, it could be a low DR, it could be customer, customer law of freehold, common law of freehold, usufractuary. If it is a stool land or skinny land, who can alienate? Who can alienate? Who can alienate? The law is settled that alienation of stool land by the occupant of the stool alone is void. Alienation of stool land by the occupant of the stool alone is void. Alienation of stool land by the elders of the stool alone is void. Alienation of stool land must be made by the occupant of the stool with the consent and concurrence of the elders of the stool. Please, when we talk about stool lands, we talk about elders. We talk about principal members when we talk about family lands. So when we talk about alienation of stool land, a valid alienation of stool land is made by occupant of the stool with the consent and concurrence of the elders of the stool. If you read the case of now, your time is almost up, but I, but I will mention and, and, and explain to you. If you read the case of appear in chief, appear, A-P-P-I-E, hyphenated in chief, appear in chief,
verses a series two reported in 2017 2020 Supreme Court Ghana Law Report. 2017 2020 Supreme Court Ghana Law Report. The Supreme Court has held that alienation of stool land, alienation of stool land by the occupant of the stool alone is void. By the elders of the stool alone is void. By the occupant of the stool with half of the principal, half of the elders of the stool is valid. So where you get the occupant of the stool? Where you get the occupant of the stool? Who alienates with the consent of majority of the elders of the stool, it is valid. So the position now is that if it is made by the occupant of the stool alone, it is void. So a PNG basis, a stool, stool has settled this matter. A stool is spelled E-S-S-U-O-W-I-N. E-S-S-U-O-W-I-N. Then in some reported cases, they use they use a, uh, a PNG versus Achena, A-K-Y-E-N-A, depending. If, if it is Mr. Adari's report, he uses Achena. That is the name of the name of the occupant of a stool. stool. So now, where an alienation is made by by an occupant of a stool, and that occupant gets half of the elders, it is valid. If the occupant of the stool does not get half of the elders, it is invalid. And another principle that has been enunciated in the stool is that Odikro a person responsible for a town cannot alienate a land without clear authorization from his overlord. And Udikru, a person responsible for a town, cannot alienate a land without an authorization from his overlord. Actually, that was the position, that was, that was the Cashman law position, but the cause gave several meanings, but now it has been settled in the Stu's case. So, we are talking about a stool. What about if the stool is vacant? Where the occupant of the stool has died, what do we do? As we said, Amankwa versus Chere, 1960 Ghana Law Report, 1959 Ghana Law Report. A stool is a corporate soul with capacity to sue and be sued. A stool exists forever. Its occupants may come and go, but the stool will be there or until maybe through annexation. And annexation now, now there's no war. We are not going for war. So stools will be there forever. But the occupants will come and go. The occupants will come and go. So where the stool is vacant, where the stool is vacant, and the person decides to alienate, what happens? You need either the, the regent or a caretaker. Who is a regent? A regent, a regent is a person who has been authorized by custom that in the absence of the chief, you act. In the absence of the chief, you act. When we talk about a caretaker, a caretaker is appointed by the elders of the stool. For example, in Kumasi, where Asante Hene is not there, Mampon Hene is the automatic regent. He will never become an Asante Hene, but he is the regent. Whenever there is an Asante Hene, Mampon Hene ceases to be the regent. But where, assuming there is no Mampon Hene and there are no big chief, they may, they may meet and decide and get a caretaker. So where there is a regent, Alienation can be made by the regent, but you need the consent, as we discussed in the student stool. Now let's move on to family or clan lands. When we talk about family land, the position is that family land is for those living, those dead, and those unborn. So always every family must have a head of family, which we call, whom we normally refer to as a Busiapenin, head of family. Now, the, the position that has been settled is that Krambo versus Fosu, where there is no head of family, that maybe the head of family has been removed, he has died, there's no head of family. Then the eldest male member of that family is presumed to be the, the head of family. The, the eldest male member of that family is presumed to be. That is Fosu versus Krambo, the ratio enunciated in that case. Now, 
Who can alienate family land? Who can alienate family land? Who can alienate family land? Family land shall be alienated by the head of family with the consent and concurrence or with the assent of the principal members of the family. So here, when we talk about, please, it is very, very important. Look at the distinction so that assuming you get in, in one of them in, in the uh, uh, objectives, you would appreciate. When we talk, when we talk about head of family, when we talk about head of family, we are saying that if we are alienating family land, we require the head of family to act with the consent and concurrence of all the principal members of that particular family. But here, there is a proviso, or there is a condition here, where an alienation is made by the head of family alone, where alienation is made by the head of family alone, it is voidable or not void. But if it is two, and it is made by the occupant of the stool alone, it is void. But where an alienation is made by, is made by the head of family alone, it is voidable and not void. It is voidable and not void. There are several cases, including Andrews versus Hayford. Andrews versus Hayford, 1982, it, 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 it's a three Ghana law report. It is one of them. Then Uusu versus Manche. Uusu versus Manche, 1993, one waka. It is one of those cases. It is one of those cases. But Kwan and Yeni, Kwan and Yeni provided, Kwan and Yeni, it provided the mode to see and not the mode to alienate. Kwan and Yeni provided the mode, the mode by which the family may bring an action to protect family property. But when it comes to alienation, when it comes to alienation or alienation or acquisition, it is the head of family together with the, eh, together with the principal members of the stool. If, it is, if alienation is made by the occupant of the, sorry, the head of family alone, it is voidable and not void, unlike stools. These are the decisions that, that you must appreciate. Then, having talked about this alienation, Let's talk about who can sue, who can sue and be sued on behalf of stool lands. Please, there is a distinction between acquisition and maintaining an action. Here, we have discussed acquisition. We are moving on to maintaining an action. How do we maintain an action in respect of stool land? As I said, in Amankwa versus Chere, a stool is a corporate stool with capacity to sue and be sued. So a stool may sue and be sued in respect of stool land. But the high court civil procedure rules provide that under such circumstances, use the name of the occupant of the stool to initiate the action. For example, you will state that um, maybe um, a Jainsia chief for himself on behalf of Sokoban stool. Let everyone know that you are the occupant of the stool and you are bringing the action for and on behalf of the stool. So that is how a stool maintains an action. But if it is a family land, the law generally is that it is the head of family who can sue and be sued. But please, that was the common law position. The head of family can sue and be sued. But the decision in Kwan and Yeni, Kwan and Yeni, Kwan and Yeni, 1959 law report, Kwan and Yeni, 1959 Ghana law report, changed the position. It did not change it, except that it provided exceptions because where the head of family is unwilling to sue and the family is losing its property, should they sit down because of, um, uh, because of anachronistic um, customary law practice? And the answer is no. So Kwan and Yeni provided several exceptions. Kwan and Yeni provided several exceptions. And the exceptions, uh, we are talking about where the family property is in danger and being lost. 
then a principal member may see. Well, or where, where, where there is division in the family and the head of family is responsible for just one of them, then any member, any principal member of that family may also see because we have five or six divisions. You are the head, but you belong to one division. So if it happens to the land in relation to the other five, other five divisions, he may not show interest. So in that sense, any principal member of that family may see. That is one of them. Then it also talked about special circumstances. Special circumstances. For example, where the, where the head of family has personal interest. Maybe, it, maybe you are litigating with, the, with, with the, uh, the sister or brother of, of the wife of the head of family. He, he will not be willing to see. So in that sense, the law permits any principal member to see. But there has been an addition. The, the High Court Civil Procedure Rule has introduced another mode. The High Court Civil Procedure Rule has introduced another mode. The High Court Civil Procedure Rule has introduced another mode. And what it says is that any member of the family can now see. Any member of the family can now see. That is odd. That is any member can see. But if you see, you must uh, you must state why you are seeing, why you are not a principal member, you are not head of family, and you are seeing. And in that sense, you, you state on the read that a copy shall be served on the head of family. So this is the exception now. So when we talk about who can sue and be sued on family lands, these are the people that we talk about. These are the people that we are interested. Now let's look at other modes of acquisition of land, other modes of acquisition. What are the other modes of acquisition? Number, we've talked about compulsory acquisition in terms of government. Then we talk about, we talk about um, war, but now there is no war. So you cannot go and conquer somebody and take that person. So that one is out now. But traditionally, it was one of them. If you read a J versus or him, or him in, it is one of them. But now, when we talk about modes of acquisition, modes of acquisition, number one is purchase, purchase or agreement, purchase. Under the old law, the Conveyance Act, it was regulated by the Conveyance Act, but now purchase of land is regulated by the Land Act. How do you acquire a land? You must be of 18. If you're not of 18, then you need somebody to act on your behalf. And in that sense, the property will be acquired in the name of the of the proprietor and the person who's acquiring it, but under 18 will be the beneficiary. So the property, so the, the proprietor will hold the trust, will hold the property in trust of that infant who is a person under 18 now, a person under 18 now. Now, under the old laws, if you read some of these cases, Tay uh, Amor, Tay a-N-G-M-O-R, Te Angmo, and Koi, C-O-Y, versus Yadom and another. There was a strict position that whenever a person bought a land, whenever a person bought a land, the customary rights were to be performed. Guaha, then they demarcated the boundaries. They, they demarcated boundaries, they brought the, the boundary owners then the customary rights were performed. If it, if, if it were not performed, it was invalid. But the, the court used judicial decisions to override that position. And Hammond versus Odoy, Hammond versus Odoy, categorically stated that once the, once the purchase was valid, there was no need going by the strict senso customary uh, practices. You could ignore them. So that is one of them. So sale, when we are talking about a sale, we talk about the parties, they must be at them, the normal contract. I said that it is contract, but when it comes to land, it is regulated by the land act because there are some things that will prevail in normal contract, but when it comes to land, it will, be, it, it will not make sense. For example, where we are talking about consideration under normal contract, and you think that, oh, yes, but in land law, 
where consideration is we are not interested in sufficiency. We are not interested in, in adequacy. We are interested in market value. So where the, where the price did not go for the market value, but anything lesser, and the person says that the property was, was acquired unconscionably, the court will, would invoke the unconscionable principle or unconscionable bargain principle to set it aside. Then you talk about gifts, another mode of acquisition. We talk about gifts. In terms of gifts, we have donor and we have donee. We have donor and we have donee. The donor, the donor is the person who has property and is giving it out to the donee. The, the donor is the person who has interest in land and he's giving out his interest in land to the donee. That is donor and donee. Now, the donor must own the land. Please bear in mind, in land matters, we always insist on nemo dat quod non habet. If you, don't, if you don't have, you cannot give. So you must have land before you can alienate. So if a person has a land and the person decides to give out the land to somebody, how is it done? That is what we mean by gifts. What we mean by gifts. So here, we need a donor we must know the property and we must know the donee. Donor, donee, then the property. We must have them. Once you have the donor, then we have the donee and we have the property. Then the next thing is that the property must be given to the donee by the donor. The property must be given to the donee by the donor. Then there must be there must be thanksgiving. I said that, please, we are discussing immovable property. We are discussing immovable property. So where a customer law gift is made and you do not accept in the presence of witnesses, it is deemed that you have rejected the offer. You have rejected the offer. So every customer law gift must be followed by I said that, they do not the donor must provide customary drink to accept the gift. Must provide to accept the gift. To provide. If you read the case of Bonnie versus Bonnie, Bonnie versus Bonnie, 1992 93 Ghana Law Report. Bonnie versus Bonnie, 1992 93 Ghana Law Report, 779. It is clear on it that if it is not accepted, it is deemed. To have been rejected. Then the locus crasticus, Yogo versus Ejukum, Yogo, Y O G U O, Yogo versus Ejukum, Yogo versus Ejukum, 1966 Ghana Law Report. In this case, too, the Supreme Court discussed that you need independent witnesses. Then there must be a seda, Thanksgiving. The a seda can be anything. The asset that can be anything, but it must be given and must be accepted. If it is not accepted, then that means it has been rejected. There is no valid asset. That. It must be given and must be accepted. It must be given and must be accepted. Now, let's look at some few uh, cases and exceptions. CC versus CC, SCSC versus SCSC. CC versus CC. 1984, it is Ghana law report. 1984, it is Ghana law report. In this case, the, the court restated the customary law position on gifts. Please listen, this one is very important. The law is that a gift from the donor to the donee is irrevocable. Once a gift is made, it is perpetually irrevocable. A gift is made and thanksgiving is offered and it is accepted. It is perpetually irrevocable. But a gift from a parent to a child can be revoked at any time. A gift from a parent to a child can be revoked at any time, even in that person's world. So assuming 
I gave a house. I gave a house to my child. And three years time, I sell the house. My, my child will tell me this one, it has, been, it has been gifted to me, so you cannot. The customer law position is that a gift once made is irrevocable, but a gift from a parent to a child is perpetually revocable. Now there is an exception. It is perpetually revocable. So what will happen? What will happen? Where you have where the property has been has been gifted to a child, and the child has spent so much to develop the property, and the parent, the mother or the father, revokes the property. What will happen? This happened in the case of Kofi Taburi, K O F I, Kofi Taburi, T A B U R O I, Kofi Taburi. Elias Nana Sabin Diawu, Elias Nana Sabin Diawu, versus Ajoa Yabuaba, Ajoa Yabuaba, Ajoa Yabuaba, Court of Appeal, Cape Coast. My brother Mafusan of blessed memory, he delivered the lead opinion. What he said, I was on the panel. What he said was that, yes, the customary position is that a gift from a parent to a child is perpetually revocable, but people should not be allowed to enrich from their wrongdoing. So if you give a house to me and I develop the house and you are allowed to come and take it over for me, that means it, it amounts to an unjust enrichment. So where a property is given to a child and the child develops the property substantially, then it becomes irrevocable. Even though it was from a parent to a child. Once the person has spent so much on the property, it will amount to fraud if the parent is permitted to revoke it. So that is what we are discussing here on, what we are discussing here on a gift. Please, I will jump because I don't want to confuse you. Let me jump and discuss another aspect of gift. This one is customary law gifts. Then when we talk about common law gifts, we call it advancement. Common law gift is known as advancement. So let's discuss common law gift. We have now discussed customary law gift. And we are saying that once it is made, it is irrevocable. But a gift from a parent to a child is perpetually revocable, subject to the child spending so much money on the property, then that one it will be unconscionable and it will amount to unjust enrichment for the parent to revoke such a gift. Now, the irony is that when we talk about advancement, please listen, advancement is very important. When it, it, it is, we call it common law gifts. We have discussed customer law gift. So let's discuss common law gift. Common law gift, when you talk about advancement, what is an advancement? Advancement means where a man, please, um, advancement, we only mention a man, we don't mention women. Where a man buys a property in the name of his child or buys property in the name of his spouse. Where a man buys property in the name of that man's, um, if a man buys property in the name of that man's uh, child or that man's wife, then we presume it is an advancement. It is a common law gift from a man to his wife, from a man to his children. These are the only instances where, where advancement is created. Unlike customer law gift, where a friend can can, can give a property, you can even give a property to, to an enemy. It doesn't matter. But when you talk about advancement, so advancement, it is an aspect of trust. When we talk about trust, we are saying that somebody has bought a property in the name of another person. And he has asked that person to take care of that property for him. So whenever he needs it, he will come for it. So whenever in, in law, we talk about trust, we are looking at two owners. We are looking at a beneficiary owner who is also known as equitable owner. Why do we call the beneficiary owner an, an equitable owner? Equity sees a beneficiary owner as the owner of the property. Equity sees the beneficiary owner as the owner of the property. And the person whose name the property is bought is known as the legal owner. 
So if a property is bought in the name of somebody, that somebody is the legal owner because the property is in his name. But the person who provides the purchase money, but the person who provides the purchase money is the beneficial owner or the owner, the true owner of that property. The true owner of that property. And some of them can be expressed, some of them can be can be resorting. For example, if Dr. Usudapa has uh, has some money with me, without his notice, I use that one to, to buy land, to build on the land. It is in my name. But who owns the money that was used to acquire it? It is doctor. So in that sense, it will go back to him. So here, here, even though the property is in my name, I bought it. I did not use my money. If we go into the person who provided the money, the purchase money, and we do tracing, we will trace it to, to Dr. Ernesto Sudapa. So I will be the legal owner and, and, and who will be the, the beneficial owner. And the beneficial owner or the equitable owner is the true owner of the property and not the person whose name the property has been acquired. Now, so when you, you, you buy property in the name of anybody, it is a trust. But if you buy a property in the name of a child, a man buys property in the name of a child, or a man buys property in the name of a wife, it creates advancement. And advancement is common law gift. And once it is made, it is irrevocable. Once it is made, it is irrevocable. You can rebut it from two angles. The rebutter is a bit technical, but I will take time to explain for you to understand. If a man buys property in the name of his children, or a man bu buys property in the name of his wife, what we are saying is that it creates advancement. But if a wife buys property in the name of the husband, it is a trust. If a child buys property in the name of the father, it is a trust. So where a man buys property in the name of the wife, or in the name of his children, or persons he stands in local parentis, that is where we talk about advancement. That is where we talk about advancement. Now, under such circumstance, if the owner, if the person, the man is saying that, yes, I bought it in your name, but it is not for you. We call it presumption of advancement. How do you rebut the presumption? How do you rebut the presumption? We rebut the presumption from two angles. Where there is evidence that before the man bought the property. The man informed people that I am buying this property in the name of my child. I'm buying this property in the name of, of my wife, but it is not for, for them or she. Here, there should be a publication before the acquisition of the property that I am buying it in your name and it is not for you. And the second one is that at the time the property was being bought contemporaneously, contemporaneously when the property was being acquired, he notified or informed people that I am buying this property in the name of my wife. I'm buying this property in the name of my child, but it is not for him. But how many people know of this law? They don't know. So they buy property in the name of their wife. They buy in the name of their child. So once it is bought, it, it becomes advancement. You cannot rebut it. You know, the difference here is that at com if it is by custom, custom law, a gift from a parent to a child is perpetually revocable. But in terms, of, in terms of advancement, once it is bought in the name of the child, you create presumption. And the two grounds that you can rebut it, that is before the purchase, I told, I told people, or contemporaneously at the time of the purchase, if you are unable to prove, then the child takes it absolutely. And this happened in the case of, in the case of, we have several cases, but I will limit you to the recent, uh, if you read Sasu Trim, Sasu, Sasu Trim versus Trim, Sasu Trim versus Trim, 1976 Ghana Law Report. It was well discussed. It was well discussed. Then if you read Remia versus Remia, Remia versus Remia, Francois J.E. As it then was, Remia versus Remia, 1981 Ghana Law Report. It was well discussed. 
it was well discussed. But the, the recent decision is Nkrumah versus Richards, Nkrumah, N-K-R-U-M-E, Nkrumah versus Richards, Nkrumah versus Richards, R-I-C-H-A-R-D-S, where a man bought property in the name of his three children. One of them died, then subsequently the man died. Then the wife of the man applied to the court for early that it was the property of the man because the man managed the property throughout, throughout his lifetime. But when it went to court, the question was, the man bought the property in the name of the child. And when the man was even going for loan, he invited the, the child to come and sign for the loan. So in that sense, we talk about the fact that it was bought in the name of the child and there was no intention for the man to rebut it. So in that sense, the child took the property absolutely. Now quite often people argue that it is, it is discriminatory. Advancement is discriminatory. Why is it that if I buy property in the name of my wife, that is advancement, she takes it. But my wife buy, buys property in my name, it is a gift. Uh, it is a trust and it is for her. So people argue that if you look at Article 17, it is discriminatory. So as a result of that, some countries, particularly Australia, has passed a law to change their position. So if it is a property is bought in the name, if a man buys it in the name of their wife or a wife buys it in the name of the husband, please, this one is, is, is Australia. I'm just using it as an example. It creates advancement, but Ghana, the law has not changed. The law is that if a man buys property in the name of the wife, if a man buys property in the name of a child or, or, or a person who stands in local parenting, then it is, it, is, uh, it is an advancement and not, a, and not a trust. He takes it absolutely because it is very difficult to rebut advancement. So the, the English position is the uh, advancement and the customer law position is the gifts. Very well. So... Having talked about this, I believe because of time constraint, let me talk briefly about a few things just to help you understand uh, some aspect of the law. You know, when I started, I said that we have, we have interest and we have rights. When we talk about rights, rights are premised on, on interest. A person with interest will permit a person to exercise a right on that person's land. And in Ghana, when we talk about rice, we talk about rice that we inherited from common law. The rice that we inherited from common law. And these rice are, these rice are basically, uh, number one, we talk about license. License, number one, license. Number two, profit apprendre. Profit apprender, profit, then act, then ponder, P R E N D R E, profit apprender. Then we talk about easements. We talk about easements. We talk about easements. We talk about easements. When we talk about, about license, what is license? License is a right, it is a permission. License is a permission, but not an easement or profit. Which a person with an interest in land may grant to a person onto his land. For example, where I permit somebody to enter onto my land and maybe farm on it. It is a license. It can be revoked. So that's why it is, it is a right and not an interest because it is premised on interest. It is a right which may be waived. A right which can also be revoked. And when we talk about uh, license, we have several types. That one, I believe you have read them. So that is license. And the difference between a license and trespasser is that where the license is revoked and you continue to be on the land, you commit trespass. So if a person is on somebody's land with authorization or with, per with permission, that is what we call a license. Where there is no permission, you commit trespass. And we say that a, a trespasser can maintain an action against everybody. Except the, except the true owner. Why do we say that? A trespasser can, com, can commence an action against everybody. 
except the true owner. Why, why do we say that? Because if the true owner is on the land, he owns the land. But if, if a trespasser is on the land, adverse possession, he's on the land, and the, and the true owner does not come, he is the person in possession. So he can maintain an action against everybody, apart from the true owner. And he can even maintain action against the true owner after 12 years by virtue of the Limitation Act, NRCD 54. NRCD 54. So please, this common law principle on land that a trespasser can maintain an action against everybody except the true owner. It holds. But in Ghana, the limitation period provides that NRCD 54, the Limitation Act, it provides that where a person remains on somebody's land, adverse possession, for 12 years, he takes the land absolutely. If you read Gihok, Gihok um, versus Hanasi, Gihok Refrigeration versus Hanasi, it will tell you that where a land, uh, where a trespasser enters onto a land for 12 years, adverse possession, without your permission, he acquires the interest of the interest of the owner prior to his prior to his um, um, entrance onto the land. So if you have a land, I enter onto the land, adverse possession, not permission, and I and I remain on the land for 12 years. I can bring an action against you for, in court for the court to order you to transfer your, your unexpired interest in the land to me by virtue of adverse possession. But what you must understand is that adverse possession under the laws in Ghana applied in all cases, but now, but now, adverse possession does not apply in terms, it does not apply in terms of public lands. That is from 23rd of December, 2020, on the coming into force of the Land Act, limitation, under the Limitation Act, does not apply against state lands. Does not, that is section 236 of the Land Act. Section 236 of the Land Act. Despite the provisions of the Limitation Act 1972, NRCD 54, and any other law, a person who unlawfully occupies public land does not acquire an interest in or right over that land by reason of occupation. Then the two, a person shall not acquire by prescription or adverse possession an estate or interest in public land. So that is what we have for you in respect of license. Let's look at easement. Let's look at easement. Easement is one of the rights. And what is an easement? At times, people get confused. We have easement, it is a common law principle. It, easement too is a common law right. Here, we are talking about right, right of way or right to sunshine or light. Where we have uh, houses and, and, and they are adjoining each other. And you have erected a tall structure. You have planted trees and I cannot access sunlight. You know, I will not feel comfortable in my house. So that is why we have easement of light. Then the, then the other one, easement of way, where there is an adjoining land, we have created, a, uh, you have built. I cannot get access to my land unless you, unless you permit me to take part of your land. If you do not permit me to take part of your land onto my land, I cannot enter onto my land. So here, where there is any access road elsewhere, and, and it will take some time, easement will not be created. But where there is no access road, and the person must, out of necessity, use somebody's land to enter, that, enter onto that person's land. That is where we create easement. And please listen to the, listen to the elements of easement. Number one, you cannot create easement in respect of your own land. So if you have land A and you have land B and you cannot enter onto land B unless you pass through your own land A, then the law says that you do not create interest. It is not an easement because you cannot create easement onto yourself. That is the first condition. Then number two, before an easement is created, then we must have adjoining land where one cannot have access. I'm talking about easement in terms of right of way. The person, there's no access, access through to that person's house. Then you must permit that person to use part of your land. So whenever we talk of easement, we talk about two important things. 
We talk about two adjoining lands. One will not have, in, one cannot assess, and the lands are owned or vested in two different persons. So the one who cannot enter onto, onto his land, unless he uses part of the other person's land, must be given access to that person's land. And the person whose land will suffer, you know, in that sense, you are going to carve part of your land for him to use, for him or her to use. So we call the person whose land will suffer, we call that person servient tenement, servient, S-E-R-V-I-E-N-T, servient tenement. You are a servant, your land has become a servant because whether you like or not, you must permit somebody to use part of your land. Servient tenement. And the person who is to be granted access onto his land, the person is benefiting from somebody's land. So now he is, he is, he is dominating. And in that sense, we call his land dominant tenement, dominant tenement. So here in every easement, we have servient tenement and dominant tenement and dominant tenement. And they must reside in two different persons. And you need access, there's no access onto your land. Or when it is um, light, you need light onto your land. But if but if that easement is not granted, you will not get access to your land. That is why we always talk about easement of right and easement of light. That is light and way. So that one is what we call easement. That one is what we call easement. Now, what is profit upon them? What is profit upon them? It is one of the rights. Profit upon them is a right given by a person with an interest in land. It is an interest in land or where a person who has interest in land permits somebody to go onto that person's land to take property from the land to, and that property must be capable of owing. If the property is not capable of owing, then you are not creating profit upon them. So if I have my land, I tell, I, I've seen Abner Chan. So I tell Abner Chan, Abner, go on to my land here. Every morning, go. Go, go and correct mushroom. Go and correct snail. That one, they are capable of being owned. I can own, own the snail. But if I tell you, Go and take snake. Is that an is that uh, uh, is that capable capable of being owned? Unless unless uh, you have a ranch of uh, uh, um, um, snakes, which Ghana I haven't seen one. So if the thing that you have been permitted to go and take from somebody's land is capable of being owned, mangoes. You can go and collect mangoes. The person tells you, go and collect mangoes for man. Mangoes are capable of being owned. But if there is a river and we are going to fetch water, the water is not capable of being owned. So if I authorize you to go onto my land and fetch water, it is not capable of being owned. So in that sense, you cannot call it a, a profit upon them. You, you give somebody authority to go onto your land to collect something which is being owned or capable of being owned. That is where you create profit upon them. Doctor, at what time am I supposed to close? Oh, no, my Lord, please. You can go on as long as uh, you are able to help. I will attend uh, what you are doing is quite fantastic because that is uh, an entire lecture on land law, and we appreciate that. So please, uh, keep going on. All right. Thank you, my Lord. You are welcome, Doctor. So let me take you through... Um, let me talk about the other modes of opposition. Then I take you, I walk you through the lands act. When we talk about the other modes of acquisition, now we've talked about purchase, we've talked about compulsory acquisition, we've talked about gifts. Then we have something we call a pledge. Please, a pledge is a common law transaction. A pledge is a common law transaction. And the law is that once a pledge, always a pledge. And pledge is perpetually redeemable. We, we redeem pledge. So pledge is perpetually redeemable. Now, let me, let me il illustrate for you. When we talk about pledges, what we are saying is that somebody may have a property, but this one, because I'm teaching land law, I'm using land. 
I have a land at uh, KNUSD. I have a land at KNUSD. Then I go to Dr. Dapa. Dr. Dapa, I have a land, but I need money. So I'll give you the land. You use it for 20 years. You give me uh, give me 50 Ghana cities or 50,000. Use the land for 20 years. That one, it is a pledge. And the position is that once it is a pledge, then possession moves. The pledge the pledge vacates possession and hand, enhance possession over to the pledge. So here we are talking about a pledge property. We are talking about a pledge. We are talking about a pledge. The person who owns the property is the pledge. And the property that the person is going to give is the pledge property. And the person who is going to give money and take the property is, 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 is the pledge. So in that sense, what happens? The law is that once a pledge, always a pledge. Limitation does not arise. So if the property is pledged to me and it is for maybe let's use cocoa fire or a house, which you correct rent. If you could correct two years rent and get 100,000, but you did not correct two years rent, you pledged it to me for 20 years. I will use the property for 20 years before I hand it over to you. You cannot come and tell me to account. In prejudice, there is no accounting. There is no accounting. But the law is that it is perpetually, it is perpetually redeemable. So once, once the time comes, the time that the parties agree, matures, then you must go and redeem. And if you go, you pay the money. You pay the money you took, but without interest. That is the, that is the uh, pledge. So here, possession moves. But title remains in the pledge, in the pledge. Possession moves to the pledge, but title re remains in the pledge. And you cannot say that uh, it has been with me for 80 years. The law is that once a pledge, always a pledge. And when you are going to redeem the property, when the time matures, you must go and pay the money that you took, but you do not pay interest. And the person must hand over the farm to you or the house to you. Now, if you look at AFRC D37, AFRC D37, it abolished prejudice in agricultural farmlands. AFRC D37 abolished prejudice in agricultural farmlands. So it converted all prejudice in agricultural, in agricultural farmlands into mortgages. It converted all of them to mortgages. So in Ghana now, you cannot have prejudice in agricultural farmlands, but you can have prejudice in, in, all, in all other things because AFRC D37 abolished only agricultural farmlands. The, the, the rationale was that people will go to Sefi, people will go to Wasa, they take over their, uh, their cocoa, their cocoa farms, which bear fruits, they take them for maybe 20 years. Meanwhile, the person will cultivate the land for two years and recoup whatever amount he gave to you. But you will come and refund that amount before you will be permitted to redeem the land after the person has benefited from it for a number of years. So that was why it was abolished by AFRC D37. So that is prejudice. Now, when we talk about prejudice, then we must talk about mortgages. You cannot talk about prejudice without talking about mortgages. Then when we talk about a mortgage, as I said earlier, as I said earlier, or early on, when we talk about a mortgage, a mortgage is a charge on a property. Here we have, and, and, and mortgages are regulated by the Mortgages Act. Mortgages are, are regulated by the Mortgages Act. Mortgages are regulated by the Mortgages Act, NRC D96, NRC D96. And we are saying that it is a contract. Mortgage is a contract, charging immovable property. It's a contract, charging immovable property. And the immovable property is used as a security. 
it is used as a security for the payment of a debt, interest, and other obligations under the loan. It is for the payment of interest. So the principal amount or the debt, interest, and any other obligation under the contract. And we are saying that it is an encumbrance on the property. It is encumbrance because it will not prevent you from alienating it. It is an encumbrance. It is a charge. It is a burden on the property. And ownership does not change. Ownership does not change. Possession does not change. Ownership does not change. Possession does not change. But the 30 days are handed over to the mortgagee. Please, in terms of mortgage, we have mortgage property, and the person who is going for the loan is known as mortgagor, and the person whom the money is, is to be taken from is known as the mortgagee. So we have mortgage property. So here we have mortgage property, mortgagor, and mortgagee. I will introduce another aspect. So here, the mortgagor goes to a financial institution, a bank or whatever, to, for a loan. Then he is asked to provide a security. And that security is in the form of a property. And it is not the property itself. He's using the property as a security, as a due payment of a loan. So if he fails to pay, that is where the property will be sold. Now, where, so here we have mortgage, mortgagee, and the mortgage property. But in some cases, the mortgagee may not have property. So he may go and seek the assistance of a person with property. That please, I want to go for a loan. Can you help me? Can you help me with your title deeds? If the person says yes, then so here we'll have a mortgage, we'll have a mortgagee who hasn't got any property to be used to secure the loan. So a third party may provide his property to secure the loan. And, the, and that third party in law, in land law, is known as obrigo. Please, if it is just ordinary loan contract, as social security loan contract, they are known as guarantors. But in land law, we don't call them guarantors. We call them obrigo. So we, we, we may have mortgage, mortgage, obrigo. Then we have that property then we have that property and the, we are saying that ownership does not move the the mortgage remains in possession the obrigo remains in possession but it is his duty to ensure that the money is paid the money is paid and if there is a breach if there is a breach there are several avenues that can be invoked one of them, you call it judicial sale. One of them is known as judicial sale. He will apply to the court for the court to sell the property. That is judicial sale. Judicial sale. You cannot take it upon yourself to go and, and sell the property. And another remedy available to the, to the mortgagee, where the mortgagee defaults in paying, is what we call mortgagee in possession mortgagee in possession. So when you go read sections 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 21, 22, and 23 of the Mortgages Act, read them. They are not difficult. They are caught in, in simple language. So we have mortgagee in possession. This is where the mortgagee is in charge of an, on an, on an immovable property. Used as due repayment for a debt and the interest thereon. And here, the mortgagee will write to the mortgagee that in, in accordance with our agreement, I'm giving you notice to vacate and give me possession because you have failed to pay. If the person agrees, okay. If the, if the mortgagee refuses, then you must apply to the court for the court to evict him for you to go and take possession. That is where there is a breach and the person has failed. That is where these, 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 these judicial reliefs are available. That is judicial sale, mortgagee in possession, mortgagee in possession. And if you are in possession, you are to account. If you fail to account, 
they will bring an action against you. And if you are in possession, you have a burden to maintain the property, render fair accounts. If you fail to do any one of them, then another one is appointment of receiver on default, where the mortgage or defaults in paying. Then you apply to the court to appoint a receiver. The receiver will take custody of the property and property maintain it and account and any proceeds apart from commissioning commission that will be paid to the receiver and the amount that will be used to maintain the property. Any income from any income accruing from that property will be used to pay part of the debt and the interest and other obligations under the loan, under the loan. So the law generally is that where we have mortgage or mortgage, where we have mortgage or mortgage obligor, and there is a default. If you read section 15, the law says that you can bring an action against the obligor or the mortgage or. But Supreme Court, the, the word or the Supreme Court has changed it to end to make it sensible. Why is it that I only use my property to secure the loan and you bring an action against me without the person who took the loan, the mortgage or? So when you read section 15, the word order has been made end. The word order has been made end. And that case is Republic versus High Court Accra. Republic versus High Court Accra. S party Chinto. S party Chinto. Republic versus High Court Accra. S party Chinto. 1992-93. I'm giving you the full citation because it is not a common case. 1992-93, Ghana Bar Report, 1144. Ghana Bar Report, Ghana Bar Report, 1992-93. 1992-93, Ghana Bar Report, page 1144. Page 1144. So please, there is a clear distinction between a more Gate and a prayer. Prayer is perpetually redeemable. And if you redeem, you refund the money that you took at the initial stage, but you don't pay any interest. And limitation does not arise because the customer law principle is that once a prayer, always a prayer. Then when we talk about in terms of mortgage, possession does not move, unlike, unlike prayer. So this one is common law, this one is customary law, customer law transaction. And this one is common law transaction. And that common law transaction has received judicial um, attention. That is why there is a statute regretting it. That is why there is a statute regretting it. Now, let me take you through some of the uh, new things brought out by the Land Act. I can't discuss all of them. I will do only few of them. Now, a new um, provision under the Land Act is that there is an establishment of management of school of management of school school or skin or family land. Management of school skin or family land. Now there is going to be established customary land, customary land secretariat, customary land secretariat, where it needs to family or whatever. If they have land, they have to establish customary land secretariat. Then they register all their land before they can alienate. Then please, when you go home, read section 13. I will talk about only part of section 13. You know, before the Land Act, only head of families were accountable under the head of family accountability uh, law, PNDC law 114, head of family accountability act 1985, PNDC law 114. It was only head of family which were accountable in respect of family properties in their custody. But now it has been extended to cover chiefs, tindanes, Head of family and any person who holds in trust property for a group of people. 
And this one derives its source from the Constitution. It derives its source from the Constitution. It derives its source from the Constitution. When you read Article 36 of the Constitution, it provides that those who uh, that the state shall hold people accountable for people who hold property um, in trust for people, then they should be they should, they should be held accountable. So now, by virtue of that, by virtue of that, you can hold a chief accountable if he fails to render accounts. You can hold head of family accountable if he fails to account. You can hold Tindana accountable if he fails to account. And apart from holding them accountable, there is also a criminal offense. And this is in accordance with Article 36, Clauses 9 and 10 of the Constitution. So now, any person in possession or in control of land belong to, belonging to a group of people is accountable to that group of people. Is accountable to that group of people. Now, what about if a property is acquired? Where property is acquired during marriage? What is the legal effect? Where property is acquired during marriage or property is acquired? So the general law in Ghana is that whenever people acquire property, whenever people acquire property, they create tenancy in common unless there is contrary intention. Please listen to this one. When, law, when property is acquired by two or more persons, at common law, the position was joint tenancy. When we talk about joint tenancy, that is where we talk about jus accrescendi. Jo joint tenancy is the same as jus accrescendi. Well, it is known as jus accrescendi. Please, let's understand what we mean by joint tenancy. Joint tenancy means that two or more persons have acquired land or land is given to two or more persons. Then the law is that the last surviving person will take the property absolutely. So if it is given to one, two, three, the right of survivorship, jus accrescendi, joint tenancy. What we say is that if you are three, the first one who dies, then the property will go to the, the property goes to the second and third. If the second one dies, then the third one takes the property absolutely because he has the opportunity or he has the right to survive the others by God's grace. He takes the property absolute. That is what we call right of survivorship. And in Latin, we call it jus accrescendi. And the legal language, we call it joint tenancy. That is the common law principle. But in Ghana, the presumption is in favor of tenancy in common. In Ghana, the presumption is in favor of tenancy in common. Meaning, where you die, you do, even though the property remains undivided, when you die, your successors in title, or those you divide the property to in your war, may come and take your portion. They will come and represent you in respect of that property, your interest in that property. So Ghana, we presume, we presume tenancy in common. And in the old law, it was section 12. In the new law, it is section 46. Section 46. Section 46. Then, at common law, at common law, the position was that third party could not benefit from transaction, which he wasn't a party. Third party could not benefit from a transaction, which he, which he wasn't. You know, the contract act changed Ghana's position. And the conveyance act changed it, and the land act has also changed it. Section 46, 3, that a third party who did not provide any consideration can benefit, provided their consideration was given on behalf of that person. He can enforce it. He can benefit and can also enforce it. Then 47 is very critical. Restrictions on transfer of land by spouse. Restriction on transfer of land by spouse. Please, 
people read section 47 without reading section 38. If you read section 47 without 38 subsections 3 and 4, you get it wrong. So let's read section 38, subsections 3 and 4 first. Section 38. 38, 3, and 4. I read. In a conveyance for variable consideration of an interest in land that is jointly acquired during the marriage, the spouses shall be deemed to be the parties to the conveyance unless a contrary intention is expressed in the conveyance. So here, the first premise is that once you live together, you live as couple, and you acquire property, and the property is jointly acquired, then you are presumed, then it is presumed that the property is jointly owned, owned by the two. But where it is not jointly acquired, please, the drafters of the law did not bring the word jointly, but parliament brought the word jointly. To resonate the word jointly as, as used in the constitution. So here, if, let me read it again, in the conveyance for variable consideration of an interest in land that is jointly acquired during marriage, jointly acquired. So if it's not jointly acquired, that is why we talk, we talk about equality is equity. Where you contributed 20, somebody contributed 80, either in cash or in kind. That is why we talk about contribution. Unless a contrary intention is expressed. Then the four, where contrary to subsection three, a conveyance is made to only one spouse that spouse shall be presumed. So where it is jointly acquired, but it is, the, it is in the name of one spouse. We presume that, that it is for the two, and that spouse holds it in trust for the others, for the, for the other spouse. But where it was not jointly acquired, I acquired my property, and, and you did not contribute anyway. That one, section 47 does not arise. So let's look at section 47. I'm reading except as otherwise provided by sections three and four of section 38. In the absence of written agreement to the contrary by the spouses in a marriage, a spouse shall not in respect of land, right, or interest in land, acquired for variable consideration. So please hear, we are referring to property acquired, don't you acquire during marriage for variable consideration. So where we, we are a couple and the property is given to me by my father, it wasn't, we did not acquire it. As a result, we, we did not provide variable consideration. So it will not become a joint property. If a friend of mine gifted it to me, it is not a variable consideration. I did not provide a variable consideration unless where a friend gifted it to me and, we, and, and I confer with my wife that this one, unless I read and read 200,000 Ghana CD or 100,000, that one it will be variable consideration. But where I provide about 10,000 and a ram and uh, three bottles of snap and two cartons of uh, beer. And that one, it is not a variable consideration. So where you acquire through inheritance, a gift, where no variable consideration is given, the issue of jointly acquired during marriage does not arise. But where the property is jointly uh, acquired during marriage, that is where you cannot sell, exchange, transfer, mortgage, or lease or enter into a contract for the sale, exchange, or transfer without the written consent of the other spouse. But the consent shall not be unreasonably withheld. The way there is that the consent shall not be unreasonably withheld. If you are going to use the property as a mortgage, and I, and I know that you are impecunious and you are extravagant, if you take the money, you are going to grow it within one month. I will not allow you. Here, we cannot say that consent cannot be unreasonable. I am withholding consent by the fact that I know you. You are extravagant. So in that sense, I will withhold consent and, and it will not be said to be unreasonable. So that is for a couple. That is for a couple. Then, um, let me discuss one or two things and uh, we call it a day. Now let's talk about 
state land. Let me talk about state land. Because I've talked about government land. And what we are saying that if government is acquiring land, government must pay fair and reasonable compensation in accordance with Article 20 of the Constitution. And Article 18, Article 18 permits people or, or reassures people's right to acquire, to acquire property. And 20, your property cannot be taken, taken. That is expropriation. It must be, if government is acquiring it, it must be compulsory acquisition, which is made in accordance with law. Now, I would like to, uh, to talk briefly about uh, public lands. Let me talk briefly. And I believe you know that land guards have been prescribed, land guards have been uh, criminalized. That one you know, land guards. And those who engage land guards, that one too has been criminalized. So if you engage a, a, a land guard, it is an offense. That one is section 12, section 12 of the, of the act, protection of land and interest in land. If you are a land guard, you commit an offense. If you engage a land guard to protect your land, you commit an offense. And the sentences are very, very harsh. Very, very harsh. So let's look briefly at acquisition of land by the state where government acquire land. It must be acquired in accordance with Article 20. And the uh, provision in the Land Act is Act 233, Act 233, Act 233, Act 233. And it deals with compulsory acquisition for public purposes. So where government is acquiring land for public purposes, Government is it's not for public purposes. Government cannot cannot use compulsory acquisition. Government must negotiate to buy. And if you read section two three four, section two three four of the Land Act, it says that government has the right, the state has the has the right to acquire land by gifts or purchase or by an agreement. So government can acquire land. But if government insists on taking a land at a particular area where the owners are unwilling to to give out. That is where we talk about composite, mainly we talk about composite acquisition. And government will acquire and acquire anything on the land. So here, what we are saying is that the basic consideration is that the land must be acquired for public purposes. And, and the public purposes, it must be in the interest of either defense, public safety, public order, public morality, public health, if government is acquiring your land to set up hospital, you cannot say no. Town and country planning purposes, resettlement purposes, or for running of essential services, you cannot say no. Or for construction of road, highway, railway, bridge, pipeline, canal, dam, sewage, you cannot say no. Or to secure development or, or utilization of land or other land in a, in a manner that promotes the public benefit. So. These are the grounds upon which government can compulsory acquire somebody's land. And if government acquires land and you enter onto government land, you commit criminal offense. Section 236, Section 236 of the Land Act, you commit criminal offense. You commit criminal offense. Now, Lands Commission manages land on behalf of the Republic of Ghana. So all lands in Ghana, public lands are managed on behalf of the state by the Lands Commission. Before I wind up, let me take you through section 282, the laws which have ceased to exist, repeals. The laws which have ceased to exist. The laws which have ceased to exist. The Land Development Act, Act 2, which permitted those people who built in Accra within the three miles radius, who built in, in good faith, that is within Asalam Down, uh, uh, Jamestown area. It did not even extend to Achimota, Legon, and those places. The law was that Act 2, in 1960, people acquired land in Accra Township, where they bought in good faith and built in good faith. 
So here they were giving protection. That is why the name of the law was Land Development Protection and Purchases Act. Then the Farm Lands Act to, to protect those who farm on the land. Then the Land Registry Act, please. Land Registry Act was enacted in 1962 to register deeds and documents. That one, it was an assignment. It was a lease. You take it to the Lands Commission, they register. They register the document. So the document indicates that this person has, has acquired this land and has registered it in his or her name. That's one you register only this and document. Please, that is why now, even though it has been, it has been repealed, it, 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 it has been repealed, but it has been reenacted under the Land Act. It has been reenacted with a little modification. Then, if you look at, if you look at administration of Land Act. Administration of land act that enable government to acquire lands and manage. If you have, if you, if you had a land, government will, will come and acquire the land, pay for only the crops or the development on the on the land. Government will not pay, pay for the for the land itself, and government will manage. So at the end of every year, government will pay um, rent to that person. So if you read Article Two C Seven of the Constitution, that's where we have administrator of school land. It is a stool land, and government is managing for and on behalf of the stool. So if, gov if, if government is managing, then 10% of the 10% will go to the administrator of stool lands. Then it comes up to 90%. Then the 90 is worth up to 100, and it is apportioned. Then the district assembly alone will take 55% for development purposes. So now it has ceased to exist. The administration of lands that has ceased to exist. So now government cannot acquire somebody's land without paying for the land and pay for only the crops. Now, if government acquires, government must pay for the land itself and acquires the highest interest in the land. The state lands are that is the compulsory acquisition. Government acquires the land and everything. That one has been reinstated in the law. Then we talk about the important one, the conveyance act. That talks about leases. How do you uh, enter into a lease? Leasehold agreement, contract, contract of sale. How do you enter into contract of sale and those things? So we have them. Then we have the public lands at which criminalizes a person who enters onto government land. Then land title registration law, PNDC law 86, um, 152, sorry. It has been repealed, but it has been reenacted. That is where government is going, where we are going to register title in addition to the document. So if the document is defective, the title will be perfect. Very interesting, was it last week? Uh, the one responsible for Otum Force Land called me that he has seen my cross, my lease, but it seems my lease is, is, is on somebody's land, <laughs> you know? So when you register these uh, documents, these are the problems that you, that you encounter. But if it is for title registration, it doesn't shift. It is located on a map and you can identify where your land is. So all those who did land law some years ago and you did land title registration, it hasn't changed word for word. And those who did uh, land registration, that we, that we registered these and documents, it hasn't changed. So don't think that the, the new law has, ch has changed almost everything. It has repealed it and has reenacted it word for word. It, it hasn't changed. So, Doc, I believe I can end here. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, my Lord, Professor Sir Dennis J. Justice of the Court of Appeal, we have benefited immensely from uh, this uh, act of kindness, uh, spending your busy time with our students. So, if my Lord is there, maybe uh, the student may want to uh do maybe one or two reactions i don't All know what right. can allow some few minutes oh i will allow very well so student please uh you have to be very respectful when the a judge is even speaking outside the courtroom it's still a judge okay so you have to show the necessary courtesies so please raise up your hand and then i will you you mention your name and then go straight forward to the point thank you very much so could you mention you can unmute yourself Uh, 
Hello. Yes, could you mention? Hello. Go ahead. Uh, my Lord, good evening. Thank you so much. Good evening. Uh, my question, yes, my question is first of first is um, uh, how would you um uh, relate advancement, you know, to maybe spousal property rights, like you just mentioned, that good. maybe when you acquire uh, a property during the dependency of the marriage. How would you relate that to? And then the other one was what your what is prescription in terms of easement? And then the last one, the last one was that okay, if I ha somebody has a, a maybe a title, a title land, and then somebody comes upon that land, can he claim uh, adverse possession even after 12 years, even though somebody has a legal title in the property? These are my three questions. When we talk about uh, adverse possession, we are talking about a person who is in physical possession of the land. So if you have title to the land and you are not in physical possession and somebody is in physical possession of that land, then adverse possession will run against you. That's when it talks about physical possession of the land. Then we are talking about advancement. So where a woman buys a property, during marriage, they acquire a property in their joint needs. If it, during marriage, they acquire property in their joint needs, because that one, it is, the man cannot say that I, that I finance everything, nor the woman could also say that I provided the purchase money. Once it is in their joint need and it is uh, acquired during marriage, it will be presumed that it is their joint property by virtue of section 38 of the, of the land act. But assuming where the property was bought by the man with their money and the property was registered in the name of the woman, then this one, advancement would arise. Advancement okay. would operate. Okay. Uh, uh, say, and then ask about prescription. Sorry. Prescription is, is an aspect of limitation. And we have the Prescription Act of 1832, which is a common law which is one of the statutes of general application, which has continued to form part of, of our law. And, and it gives instances under which, under which a person will take absolutely a right that the person has exercised without your consent. So when we say that easement by prescription, that means the, that easement was created under the Prescription Act of 1832. It has not been repealed. It continues to form part of our law. So where I have a land, then you cannot enter onto your land and, 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 and I permit you to enter. That one is under the prescription acts. So when you hear it's meant by, by, by prescription, meaning and it has been created under the prescription act. Okay, my, my Lord, we will allow another uh, person, uh, one lady. All right. Coffee right. Boatin. Coffee Boatin, yes. Coffee Boatin, please. Unmute yourself. Your hand is up. Yes. Good evening. Yes, good evening. Um, the law permits for um, a non citizen to um, have or own land for 50 years. In a situation whereby there is one non citizen and one citizen. What happens to the duration when it comes to them? When they are married, actually. The law is clear on it that you cannot use marriage to take advantage of that principle. The, the law has specifically stated, let me clear it in section 10. Section 10. That, um, let me see. A, a leasehold interest of more than 50 years held on 22nd day of August 1969 by a person who is not a citizen of Ghana is deemed to be an interest or right subsisting for a period of 50 years, commencing from 22nd day of August 1969. The reversionary interest in leasehold under section 7 shall vest in the lessor. Then, the restrictions imposed on sections 1, 2, 3, and 7 on the interest that a person who is not a citizen of Ghana may apply in land shall not be affected by the marriage of that person to a citizen of Ghana or by the entry of that person into a partnership with a citizen of Ghana. So you cannot use marriage or citizenship to take advantage of that law. So 
you create the 50 years. If you want your spouse, who's a citizen of Ghana, to acquire it, let the person acquire it for maybe a, a leasehold of 1890. And now the, the Land Act has abolished all sorts, any form of freehold alienation. The land that has abolished any form of freehold alienation. So now the only interest that you may acquire, which may subsist for years, is a lease of maybe up to 99 years. All right, thank you, my lord. Uh, my lord, there is this uh, question here from the at uh, one of the students. Uh, All right. He's put it in the chat. Uh, All right. Uh, one Ben. Uh, I'm just reading what he's put down. Article. Uh, I think it's not clear, but. No, just trying, okay. Uh, of the 1992 constitution, prescribe acquisition of uh, freehold interest for two lands. Meanwhile, section two of Act 1036, that's the Land Act, also approves an individual to acquire an alodia. Why would the law ignore alodia and rather save freehold, which is a lesser interest from acquisition? Uh, so that is uh, uh, his question. Very good question. You know, before the coming into force of the 1969 constitution, non-citizen of Ghana could acquire all the freeholds interest except the Alodia. You could not hold Alodia interest because Alodia interest was vested in schools, clans, families, or whatever. So what you could acquire was either common law freehold or the other forms of interest. So the, if you read article two, article two, sorry, section two, Section two re emphasize that the fact that the highest interest, the highest interest shall be still be vested in stools, kings, family, crowns, and what have you. It is the customer law freehold or the common law freehold, which non citizens may acquire. And it is that one that has been prescribed. Uh, thank you, my lord. My lord, we have the last four questions, and then my lord right. has really done very well. You haven't drunk water or this one. Could you mention? Could you mention, uh, yes, please be snappy so that uh, other people can get opportunity. My Lord can. Uh, go oh, sorry, ahead. I I asked my question earlier, so it's on earlier. All right, all right, okay, that's go. fine. Then, all right, then put your hand down, okay. Uh, uh, I think there's a, Sam, uh, Sam Mahmoud Ahmed. Sam. Yes, sir. Um, sir, my question was on the on the. The one that you just read about the fact that oh, right, um, right, right. If it's answered, then that's fine. Don't that's let's give time. Okay, that's fine. Thank you. <laughs> uh, then will Edwards, uh, will Edwards, uh, please unmute yourself. Yes, will Edwards. Hello, good evening. Yes. Good evening. Please, my question is on um, the composure acquisition. Yeah. The submission. We we got to know that the land can be compulsorily acquired for public interest, yeah. for public purposes. But uh, in the case of Kujetua um, Blakwa, and I think Obiche Dilamte, yeah. there was um, a tassel over the land being used for private business. And the court came in and expanded the meaning to include um, anything that the government, uh, I'm not getting the word right, but when the government chooses to use it for um, something other than what it was meant for, it still falls yes. under public interest. So, if you can kindly clarify exactly yes. what we will, we will, we will, we will term as public interest or private. It's a good question. Now, if you look at the constitution, if you look at the constitution, Article Twenty, the Cross Five, will tell you that where government acquire, where government acquires land from a person and the land is to be used for public purpose and the government is not using it for that public purpose or for any other public use. The word there is for any other public use. So it is not that, it is not that the court introduced anything, a, a new thing. The court just restated what was there and gave life to the law. So let me read it to you. It's inside the constitution here, yes. Article 20.
Yes. Article 20, cross 5. Any property compulsorily taken possession of or applied in the public interest or for public purpose shall be used only for the public interest or for the public purpose for which it was acquired. So it was only in the public interest or the word there is all disjunctive for public interest or for the public purpose for which it was acquired. So if it is not used for public interest, so where it was acquired for a particular purpose, but if it is used in other way to serve public interest, then it is sanctioned by Article 20, Cross 5. Uh, thank you, my lord. My lord, I think, uh, my lord, the, the, I think most of the things the accent have been taken care of. So, my lord, we would like to use this opportunity to say a very big uh, thank you for the time that you have spent with us. And I am sure that if the students were allowed to speak one after the other, uh, everybody will endorse all that you have said and demonstrate how they have benefited uh, from what you have done. So we are very grateful and I am very confident that the students have actually benefited. And I have a few uh, even learned uh, colleagues, some lawyers who also participated. So we are all That's very good. grateful to you, my Lord. May God bless you. You are welcome. Thank you for accepting our invitation. You are very grateful, my Lord. Thank you. It's very a pleasure to serve, to serve your country. <laughs> Thank you very much, my Lord. All right. Thank mm -hmm. you very much. And you are welcome. Thank you. And, and students, uh, in the light of uh, the extensive discussion we have had, this will be the last class for today. And we'll let you know what we have uh, for you uh, tomorrow. So on that note, I will say that you can go to the YouTube and, and, and play all the recording of all the lectures we have done uh, ever since, including Paul's uh, lecture. Thank you very much. And have a good night.